Okay, good afternoon, everyone. This is the uh, Westminster Confession uh, discussion for this afternoon. I wonder if, uh, Jim, you would open up with a word of prayer for us? Sure. Father, thank you for your word and how you have allowed these, uh, these saints of yours in the past to put it into a concise, uh, laid out, way that we could uh, get a better glimpse of who you are and how you deal with your church and your people. And we ask that you would bless our minds and our understanding that we would retain what brings glory to you and honor in our behavior and thinking, and that you would uh, work in the church to build it up. Uh, we thank you for your presence, the power of your spirit. We ask that you please protect us from any anything that would build pride rather than dependence on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, everyone, this afternoon we are uh, resuming where we left off last time in chapter 27 of the Westminster Confession of Faith. The title of chapter 27 is Of the Sacraments. And we just began uh, paragraph one last time. And we're about halfway through uh, this time. I'll read the whole paragraph and then we'll begin at. Uh, Point C. Let me share the screen so everyone can see what, uh, what we're discussing. All right. Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 27 of the sacraments. Sacraments are holy signs and seals of the covenant of grace, immediately instituted by God to represent Christ and his benefits and to confirm our interest in him. As also to put a visible difference between those that belong unto the church and the rest of the world, and solemnly to engage them to the service of God in Christ according to his word. We begin at the text highlighted in, uh, in yellow in the paragraph, and our first proof text is for you, Jim, and that's from Romans 15, uh, verse 8. Okay, for I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs, and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. Okay, this, I, I think the most important thing is that it points back to God. Yes. Um, and that these things were, were evidences or, or means by which we would bring glory to God and show forth his mercy. Indeed. And uh, also looking back at that paragraph, the, the clause in there to put a visible difference between those that belong unto the church and the rest of the world. And I think the, the passage in Romans also draws a distinction there as well. Yes. That Christ so became this, a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness. And then the in beginning of verse 9 points us to the Gentiles also. Uh, but first the Jew, then, then the, the Gentile. Yes. And, and some people in the use of this word sacrament... And the Protestant Church, we we have a little bit more caution with that word because uh, we don't believe in any actions being meritorious, although that's not necessarily the way they're using that word. Um, and circumcision did not um, make them right with God. It was a sign and seal that God required for obedience, but it wasn't. Um, there were many who were circumcised who were detestable to God. Yes. Yeah, but just an outward sign rather than an inward sign. Well said, Jim. Yes. All right, our second proof text, Gordon, comes to us from Exodus chapter 12, verse 48. If a stranger shall, sh shall sojourn with you and would keep the Passover to the Lord, that all the males be circumcised, then he may come near and keep it. He shall be as a native of the land, but no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. Uh, these were some Passover restrictions that the Lord gave Moses. 
and it was to prevent you know foreigners uh, or uh, day workers from participating or partaking of the Passover without uh, being a, a circumcised individual. It was a requirement and a requirement of obedience. Uh, and certainly, you know, for a male adult uh, at that particular time to be circumcised was uh, a challenge, you know, to want to do it, to want to participate in that way. But that was the rule. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other uh, thoughts? Um, yeah, the, the, uh, the, the Baptist Confession of Faith does not call these sacraments, but ordinances. Mm -hmm, that's right. And we'll be uh, talking about that uh, next time when we look at chapter 28. And that specifically mm -hmm. looks at baptism. We talked a little bit about this in the Sunday school this morning. Uh, and this is where uh, uh, we, you know, I, we somewhat differentiate from, uh, from Pado Baptist uh, because this paragraph starts by saying that sacraments are holy signs and seals of the covenant of grace. Uh, and circumcision uh, was an act of obedience. Um, and there was a salvific promise within the Abrahamic covenant, but it was not all. The entire Abrahamic covenant was not all a covenant of grace. There were uh, promises that were made in terms of property and, and descendants and so forth that had uh, gone well beyond the salvific promise. But uh, signs and seals are the language that uh, that Pado baptists like to use in terms of, of believer's baptism. It is a sign and a seal because they see you uh, uh, baptism of infants or they see baptism in a general sense as a continuation, a New Testament continuation of circumcision. Indeed, that's true. So that's the reason why next week we'll specifically, or the next time we meet, it'll be specifically regarding baptism. And then, and then following that will be the uh, paragraph devoted to the Lord's Supper. Mm. All right, the, our next uh, proof text is Genesis 34, 14, Pastor. Okay, this is the trip to the Shechem uh, people. And uh, it says this, uh, they said to them, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised for that would be a disgrace to us. And this is really just the correlation of those that are inside or outside the covenant mm -hmm. community. Bapti with baptism, uh, it's a distinguishing mark of those that uh, publicly say we belong to Christ. Mm -hmm. And that is, uh, that is the intention. Yeah. Well, but you know what's, uh, what's kind of, I guess, for me, unusual about the Westminster Divines using this passage, the Shechem incident uh, was, as you just said, Pastor, uh, uh, they they used it as a as a way to you know to defeat defeat these people, uh, to violate them you know because they were they they proceeded to get circumcised, but it wasn't you know it, they allowed that to happen, but it wasn't for them to show that they belonged to the church and the rest you know they, it was to it was to make them pay for you know what they had done you know yeah. Well, but I just think it is, it's interesting it kind of cuts off right there. You know, because uh, they did ultimately end up getting circumcised, but it wasn't for, you know, the purpose of belonging to the church. Yeah. All right, this ends the uh, this section of paragraph one. The, the next passage uh, has to do with uh, the last clause of uh, paragraph one, which reads, and solemnly, and he's still talking about the sacraments that have been instituted by God and solemnly to engage them to the service of God in Christ according to his word. And the first proof text for you, Ray, is a Romans chapter six, verses three and four. I included uh, one and two in there as well for context. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and read, uh, starting with verse one, Romans six and one to four. What shall we say then? 
we continue in sin that grace may abound uh, by no means how can we who die to sin still live in it do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into G christ jesus were baptized into his death we were we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the father we too might walk in the newness of life so the you know baptism symbolically you know a representation and you know of us as in you know point d uh, that we're in service to god uh, in christ so this sacrament that signifies that uh, now that uh, we were once uh, uh, live one way now we're going to live in another way and um, i'm sure there's more uh, that we could add to that uh, as well uh, any other thoughts or comments, gentlemen? Yeah. Well, the only thing, uh, you know, with regard to sacrament, uh, there are some uh, theologians that uh, would not say that this, you know, they would, that we would all uh, uh, say that it's not, has no, baptism doesn't have any saving power, mm -hmm. but uh, it is a, they say it is a sacrament in terms of uh, the holiness uh, issue of, of imputing uh, God's holiness and 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 you know correspondingly His grace, but not that it saves you. Uh, matter of fact, Einwechter, William Einwechter says that in his, uh, in his understanding. Okay, I don't know, uh, Pastor. I, I you know we really haven't talked that much about uh, uh, you know the difference you know in terms of uh, defining sac what what sacrament means. I think there's a lot of of differences of, of definition on that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, in terms of, uh, I think Jim just mentioned it a bit ago, you know, and certainly we don't, uh, we don't believe baptism has uh, salvific power. You know, there is, you know, uh, some holiness involved in, in terms of uh, preparing us for remembrance of Christ. I just was wondering what your thoughts might be on that. Uh, really, I think I would just echo what Jim said. And the distinction should be guarded that, um, you know, we would call, we would refer to the ordinances just to stay away from, not that the word sacrament is in, in itself wrong, but the concept of, right. that it's a means of grace is not even in itself to say it's wrong, but to, to think of those acts uh, of obedience as being meritorious, there's the heart issue and the problem. And so Jim, Jim said that really well, and uh, really there's not much to add to it. This particular chapter 27 does not refer only to baptism, though. Mm -hmm. It refers to both of the ordinances yeah. of the church, the baptism and the Lord's Supper. And it's similar so, with both, yeah. Yeah, so this is just a general uh, uh, paragraph. And uh, next time we'll, we'll talk about baptism in particular. And the following uh, session, we'll talk about uh, the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll get into yeah. more specific uh, discussions uh, in, the, in the next two sessions. Okay. Well, I guess one final question, though. Are the divines saying that uh, baptism is a sacrament? Is that what they're saying in paragraph one? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. And the difficulty is that it's it's really not a sacrament it is an act of faith that you you're doing something like naaman did it doesn't necessarily make much sense physically speaking how could this what we're doing be any anything that pleases god this seems like insignificant but you're doing what god said to do because he said to do it and you want to please him and because of that it's an act of faith and God looks on it with a smile. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not 100% opposed to someone using the term sacrament for these, what we would call ordinances. It's just like a sacred thing that you're doing. It's something that's set apart is what you're saying. 
Um, what Jim said about the meritorious aspect of it is where we have to draw a line. Yes. So, you know, just to call it a sacrament, I'm not going to, I'm not going to pick any fights over that with, you know, Presbyterian or whoever. Uh, of course, the Roman Catholics have five seven. added to this. Yeah, yeah total seven, seven yeah. <laughs> Which seven is a very attractive number, but um, <laughs> of course, they, uh, the, the Roman Catholic Church dispenses merit through these, and that's, that's, the, uh, that's the trick. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's not the intention of any of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Correct. Exactly. They, they will take it so far as to say that is the entry into the church by being baptized. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's kind of flipped on its head because really what, it, what uh, the entry into the church is evidence of the Holy Spirit's regeneration in a person's life. Yeah. Following yeah. that, a person would be baptized. If you put, if you, it's like putting the caboose before the engine. And forgetting the engine, it's mm-hmm. just you're, you're not going to go anywhere with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a thing of man's doing, and uh, it sort of confuses the old covenant with the new, and it it sort of tricks people into thinking that the power to regenerate a human soul is in a priest baptizing them, which is wrong, uh, because you just look at Romans six, and the whole point: true baptism is being put into union with Christ. What we do in, in the water when we plunge someone in is a physical representation of what has happened spiritually. And that regeneration is something God causes to happen, not any man. Indeed. And, All right. Yeah, go ahead. Well, we do, uh, I mean, we do, we do practice baptism and we do, it is encouraging to see someone you know, get baptized because it's, it's, you know, you see this movement of, of new life, you know, when someone has uh, been saved and they're uh, following God's word as he commanded us to be baptized. And we're encouraged by that. So the grace, I like that, that grace that uh, comes out of that, that is encouraging to us as a believers that uh, that baptism has. I wanted to just state that. You know, just, just, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, we're doing all the denials. I'm glad that Ray said something that's yeah. positive about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. All right. Uh, the next. Uh, let's see, Ray. You read uh, Romans six. Our next proof text that I'll be reading comes from 1 Corinthians and chapter 10. And the two verses in particular that they cite are 16 and 21. But I'm, for context, I'm going to read the, the passage. This is Romans 10, beginning in verse 14 and going through verse 22. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to sensible people, judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar? What do I imply then? that food offered to idols is anything, or that an idol is anything? No. I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. I do do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Uh, Paul here is pointing out the, uh, the discrepancy here with uh, uh, this uh, being in the service to God. And we, we read in scripture that uh, uh, God is a jealous God. He does not want to share his, uh, his uh, Godhead with, with anything else. Idolatry is offensive to God. 
as is uh, any allegiance to anything but God. So it has to be uh, any participation in the sacraments or the ordinances, more, more correctly I want to talk about, would be uh, faithful to the, uh, our service to God in Christ and according to his word. Uh, anything else you'd like to add uh, to we that? We talked point? about this in Sunday school today in the inquirers class. Oh, well, that's uh, good. Uh, well, it was regarding the, uh, uh, you know, at, w when is it, is it proper for, for children uh, to participate in, uh, in the Lord's Supper and so forth? And uh, we talked about, you know, how that might happen. But I think, you know, the point that Pastor made was one of the things we always have to be on guard for is, you know, participation in, in the Lord's table in an unworthy manner. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bible warns, you know, very much against that. And I think that's very much reinforced in this passage. How does, does Paul's uh, figuring in here, the food offered to idols uh, and, and pagan sacrifice into uh, what the Westminsters are saying? I, that was a question I had when I, when I read this text that uh, perhaps maybe that's why the, uh, they only included verses 16 and 21. That, that is the cup of blessing that we bless is not a participation. Is it not a participation in blood? Well, it is. And the bread is a participation in the body of Christ. Yeah. I, I think, I don't know if this is a, a good answer to your question or not, but you know, in the book of First Kings, uh, you know, we see the evidence of the influence that the pagan uh, women had on, on King Solomon. And, you know, he was offering uh, sacrifices in, in high places to uh, the gods of, of the pagan women that, uh, mm -hmm. that he allegedly loved uh, so very much. And then of course, you know, in the same breath, he's trying to, you know, he's trying to uh, uh, make sacrifice, you know, to God uh, that, that does not work. I mean, God, uh, God does not approve of, of that kind of situation. You can't have it yeah. ways. You know, you either love God or, or, or you know, this other, this other thing. I think that's kind of what Paul's looking at here, too. You can't have it both ways. And all we have to do is uh, look at Amos as well. Yeah, I can. Um, what was going on uh, pri prior to the exile? There are two ways that these two have a contrast. The first is, it's the first, the first section here in 16, the cup of blessing. Um, it is a blessing to participate in, in the meritorious uh, substitutionary, you know, this alien righteousness. It's a, it is a blessing for us to be under the blood of Christ, that that sacrifice was for our for the remission of our sins yeah. and satisfaction of the of the Father's wrath toward us. It is a single. It's a one-sided activity on God's part for our our good, opening the relationship between us and God. Whereas, in contrast to the one below. When people do these sacrifices to demons, they're trying to do a tit for tat. You give us good, uh, good crops or good weather or uh, a, a safe passage on the sea and, because we're going to give you this animal and it's the meat and the blood. Um, we're going to celebrate your, your little fiefdom and therefore have... Um, safe passage uh, in this realm of yours and um, it was a whole different approach it was it was like it was like buying off a judge as opposed to uh, entering into relationship with a loving father indeed well that that does help answer the question thank you jim all right We're moving on into paragraph two i'll read the paragraph and then uh, uh, Jim, you have the first proof text after I read it. Uh, paragraph two. 
there is in every sacrament a spiritual relation or sacramental union between the sign and the thing signified. Whence it comes to pass that the names and effects of the one are attributed to the other. And they, they cited this uh, proof text in Genesis 17, verse 10. Uh, Jim? And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall, shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. Mm -hmm. Now that included, in this context, um, it there you know doesn't say anything about the extent. They're just saying every male among you. It, it, you could think that it would only be within your family, uh, but it also is expanded to include those who might work for you, mm -hmm. mowing your fields or tending your sheep, um, people who are dwelling in your country. And we don't do, I mean, it, we, we don't do that now. We don't baptize contractors that come to work on our house or uh, things like that. So there's no direct correlation between the circumcision and, the, and baptism in that regard. which the, uh, supports the view that uh, this, in this case, circumcision or baptism even uh, would be uh, outward signs and proof of already an inward uh, faith or a change of heart and, and uh, faith in God. Yeah, I, I, I don't really like this one, this paragraph. No. No. And the reason is, I, I would say this is muddled speech. So my, my specific question would be to, to someone, what, what exactly do you mean by a spiritual relation? Yeah. Because that seems very vague. And it gives the impression that what you are doing physically is causing a, a change within the person. And that is something that we, you know, we we don't cause the beginning of a person being united to Christ and we don't cause um, the continuation of God's uh, work of grace in a person's life in the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's, 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 I, 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 it's hard to say that it's technically wrong, but the spiritual relation is what that, that phrase, it gives the impression that, um, that we're causing something to happen by our actions rather than uh, entering into something by obedience. So an ordinance would be different in this. Like we would, we could guard against this concept by not confusing people um, by, by thinking that um, our actions are causing something to happen, but rather we are, we are entering into something. Now, is there, is there a spiritual element that is, enjoyed and i think this gets to what ray was saying you know is there anything spiritual happening within the fellowship when a person publicly declares their their um faith in christ and they are baptized uh well yes and and is there i mean just first corinthians 11 and we'll, we'll get to this in a couple of in a couple of chapters uh whenever we observe the lord's supper is there anything that's happening spiritually there Yes, of course. And, and just look at what it says in, in that chapter. Okay. Um, but this whole idea of um, in every sacrament, there is a spiritual relation or a sacramental union. It's just too muddled. I don't like the way that I don't like the way it says it says that it gives the impression of it, it, to me, it, it, it sounds like things that I've heard from from people that I, I respect, who lead families with young children especially to believe that their children have been somehow affected by the actions of a pastor within a church 
having water sprinkled on their child's head, that that has somehow sealed their child in a spiritual way to Christ. And that is not how it works, nor to give children, because some, some of these churches will give the, the, even infants uh, the Lord's Supper, thinking that they are doing something spiritual for that child. And that is just misleading people, and it's wrong, mm. and I think they'll be judged for it. Um, I, I think that, like, I, again, Presbyterians are the ones that I'm thinking of with this, and I, what I'm talking about with children receiving the Lord's Supper, I think it's a hyper-Presbyterianism. But and a view of the covenants that I think is overreaching and, and just wrong. Um, so this paragraph, I think it's muddled speech. And um, for those reasons. Pastor, this was exactly the belief that was held in the church that I grew up in. Mm -hmm. I was baptized as an infant by sprinkling. And I was permitted to uh, participate in the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. as a uh, as a boy as a teenager even though uh, I had uh, technically joined the church but I, I really didn't have I really didn't have a, a true conversion at this point mm -hmm. and there was no um, uh, no effort made to ensure that that I was truly converted mm -hmm. at that time so, uh, and so I, I agree with you. It, uh, it wasn't until much later in my life that uh, I, I realized the truth. And in all those years, I thought there was something special that had already happened when in, in fact there hadn't been. Mm -hmm. Well, if you listen to the words too, and I think this is where the disconnect is for me. If you listen to the words of uh, some of these uh, Protestant churches that do practice uh, infant baptism, uh, the words that they use as they as they sprinkle uh, would lead you to believe that there is uh, some uh, salvific promise that is associated with this child becoming part of the invisible church uh, automatically through that process. I mean, the words are you know are are kind of revealing that way, and I think that's right. connect this for me. You get you get the very slippery and muddled speech with phrases among among you know, sound theological churches where they'll say, and this is an error, they'll say, these are children of the covenant. And as if the, the children growing up in a Baptist church are not a part of a covenant community. And then you'll get this, this uh, assurance and comfort towards families to tell, to say that their children have been sealed. Um, they've been sealed um, with the, the sign of the Holy Trinity and uh, meaning bap meaning their baptism and those are misleading things sure. to put faith in to put faith in a, in a sacrament uh another another point that you made gordon is a really good one where uh, ch other churches will go even farther than this so um episcopals and roman catholics um will believe in baptismal regeneration and a really good there's a really good sermon by um charles spurgeon that refutes that uh and you can just look at look up baptismal regeneration yeah. by charles spurgeon and read it yeah by the way a long time ago just as an aside comment on you know i i don't want to sound like we're all picking on the catholics here but um in, in as part of their practice uh, uh roman catholic priests uh if a if a mother was about to deliver a stillborn child uh, they would baptize that stillborn as the head was exposed, you know, as if it had uh, that, that action had some uh, uh, connection with that child going, you know, going to heaven and being saved, you know, which is unfortunate, but that I, I read that uh, uh, that was right out of a, of a priestly handbook on that kind of thing. So. Okay. Yep. Uh, the church I grew up and we even went so far as to obtain water from the Jordan River in order to baptize the infants by sprinkling. So I was baptized with uh, a little bit of water from the Jordan River when I was an infant. And uh, I, for years, I thought that was something special, but uh, perhaps perhaps I was misled there. Yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, I was, the water from Flint, Michigan is just as good. That's right. <laughs> just don't drink it.
Just don't drink it. I'm not sure if I wanted to drink the river, the river Jordan water either. <laughs> no. Yeah. Oh well. Anyway, uh, shall we continue? Well, if you were going to use, if you were going to use special water, I would have say take it from the pool at Best Saida. But uh, hey, that's just, yeah. yeah, that would be special. <laughs> yeah, anyway, uh, All right, sh shall we continue in paragraph 27, two? 28. Yeah, this is uh, for you, Gordon. Yeah. And now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after the blessing, uh, and after blessing it, uh, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, "Take eat. This is my body." And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Uh, obviously, this, these words were spoken right after uh, Jesus identified to Judas that he, in fact, was the one who would betray Christ. And uh, uh, to this, to the hearers of this passage for the very first time, for them, uh, it was an opportunity to understand that uh, as Jesus was about to go to the cross, uh, his, his broken body and his blood was being shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. For us today, uh, as we uh, participate in, in the Lord's ta table, uh, and, you know, the words obviously for us come from First uh, Corinthians chapter 11, but uh, uh, for us, you know, it is a memorial. It is remembering uh, what Christ has done for us and that his body was broken for us and his blood was shed for us. And because of that, we have, uh, for those of us who have received him, uh, we, we, are, we are saved. Our sins are forgiven just as if we had never sinned. Yeah, well, well said, Gordon. And uh, just to add a little bit to that, uh, the, when Jesus said, this is um, the blood, my blood of the covenant, it was, he was not saying this is literally my blood, nor did he say, whenever you have grape juice or wine, it will become my blood. He was saying this represents my blood. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah we, a matter of fact, uh, we understand that uh, in terms of how we participate, but uh, again, uh, yeah. That there are churches, the Roman Catholics in particular, that uh, believe that uh, I forget what they call that uh, trans something or substantiation. Transubstantiation. Transubstantiation, it, right. That is this text the, the basis law. for that? And uh, others. You th and, and others too? Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I would say, we... I give a crude yeah, answer to that sometimes. I say, look, Jesus said, I am the door, but he didn't become a slab of wood. You know, he. He was using a figurative sense. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think what you guys are saying is accurate in that, that the occasion that, he, that this occurs is the Passover. And when he takes that cup that, of the celebration of the Passover, that's when he says, this is me. This is my blood or this is me and this is my flesh. Because he's talking about him being the sacrifice for sins. Not that that uh, this is actually me in any you know in liquid or Correct. in meat, either way. Representative, right. All right. The, the third and last uh, proof text for paragraph two is from Titus three, uh, verse five. This is for you, Pastor. Okay. He said it's not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. You see, I just think that uh, proof texts like this. In fact, I went through the book of Titus with some of our women that are going to the Simeon Trust Workshop for Women this week over in Westchester. And um, uh, this, is not, this is not saying that the washing of, of baptism is the same thing as the washing of regeneration and it just confuses the whole issue to, to make this a proof text with this paragraph so i know i'm like i'm poo-pooing the party of the westminster divines but i think they're wrong on this yeah indeed i love them and i'm thankful for all the rest and we can rejoice over the the things that these proof texts do reveal <laughs> when we get to just the to be city, happy about something when we get to the big city we can have this discussion with them how about it there you go yeah. Because of all this hard work that they did and our ability to stand on their shoulders, we have a better view. But that doesn't yeah. make everything yeah. that they've 
they've strived to do, it doesn't legitimize it. Well, we just always, I think, have to remember that is the scripture that is inspired. It is not the Westminster divines that are inspired. Right. Yeah, and we are humbly offering our perspective on these things. The standard for us all between us and the Westminster divines when we disagree on these things is God's word. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. That's the plumb line. That's, That's the plumb line. line. Amen. <laughs> yeah. If you refer I thought he to did well with that. I like that. He did well. Yeah. I thought he did really well with that. That is the plumb line. Yeah. All right. Let's move into uh, paragraph three now. And uh, I'll read the paragraph. And then, Ray, we have the first proof text for you. Paragraph three. The grace which is exhibited in or by the sacraments rightly used is not conferred by any power in them. Neither does the efficacy of a sacrament depend upon the piety or intention of him that administers it, but upon the work of the spirit and the work word of institution, which contains together with a precept authorizing the use thereof a promise of benefit to worthy receivers. Now, I got to ask you a question. Did I pronounce the word P-I-E-T-Y correct? Piety. 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 All right. My mistake. I apologize for that. So it's piety. But uh, this is uh, paragraph three. And the first proof text is Romans 2, 28 and 29, right? It'll be Romans 2, 28, 29. For no, uh, for no one is a Jew who is uh, merely one outwardly nor is circumcision outward and physical. Uh, but a Jew is one uh, inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of uh, the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. This praise is not from man, but from God. So I think the iterative words is uh, they're talking about, uh, you know, that this... Uh, this sacrament, this ordinance, um, you know, attributed to the work of the Holy Spirit by the Spirit, uh, right there, in um, verses twenty-two, that um, this <clears throat> the circumcision of the heart uh, is by the Spirit. There. Yeah, which you prefer find a paragraph three, but upon the work of the spirit. Yes. When, uh, when Paul is talking here in Romans, he says, not by the letter. Is, does he mean not by the letter of the law? The, the ordinance it, itself, the way it reads? Or that uh, the spiritual aspect of it? He, I think he's talking about the spiritual aspect of what makes one a, a believer and have faith in God. Yeah. As, as you connect this, uh, this first part of the paragraph, which is section G, to the proof text, uh, it's also making a comment about uh, the person that administers uh, the, in this particular case, circumcision. It has nothing to do no. Uh, the efficacy of the of the the action has nothing to do with uh, the piety or the intention of the of the person administering it. It's a matter of the heart. Mm -hmm. uh, I, to me, I think this particular passage deals with you know what is in fact the true Israel of God. Uh, those who have received Christ as as their Lord and Savior. You know, it's not an outward thing; it's an inward thing. Right. Uh, and in our case. You know, it is reserved for those who put their faith and trust in Christ. Indeed. Okay. Thank you. And notice here, the thing that I like about this verse is uh, it's correlating in a continuum, if anything, the connection between circumcision, that's, that's uh, that in the male parts. Uh, it's correlating that or connecting it to a matter of the heart. In that in, in the Old Testament, there were many places where, where God stated that he wanted his people to be circumcised in their heart. 
to have a heart for him, to love him, and not just to have the outward sign. And um, he, he actually condemned them in, in some cases because they acted like uncircumcised people, even though they had the outward sign. And it goes back to what we're saying that the change in the heart precedes the outward evidences and the outward evidences do not give you merit or, or an improved relationship with God for the inward um things that were supposed to proceed indeed okay all right thank you jim uh, move down to the uh, next text is uh comes from first peter 3 21 i'll be reading uh, that baptism which corresponds to this now saves you not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers, having been subjected to him. Now, this is, uh, unfortunately, I've never really done an in-depth study of Peter. I really should do that. Uh, I need a little help on this one. What is Peter saying here in uh, 1 Peter chapter 3? Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, but not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yeah, I think what he's saying is that Christ being the proximate object of your faith is how you okay. are saved when you publicly declare that it's um it's sort of it's just putting a stake in the ground and he's he's saying that a person whose faith is in christ is saved you are in union with him and that is um you know it's all it's all evidence of regeneration okay yeah, yeah. but the, fact, the, uh, the salvation yes. comes first and then the, the passage the passage ends a little bit abruptly uh, before you get to what Pastor just said, but uh, what saves you later on in in, uh, uh, in the following verse is uh, it saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's verse twenty one yes. of, of that. Yeah, and this part here where it talks about uh, appeal to God for a good conscience when you be, when you obey what God has told you to, uh, to obey, such as believe and be baptized. When you're baptized, your conscience is clear that you, you have obeyed. There is nothing separating you from your father in the relationship. You can then approach the father and say, oh, yes, I did what you, what you have told me. Thank you. Thank you for directing me to do that. But without that, you're always wondering, did, you know, is, is my fear of man or the people around me, is it greater than what my father has told me to do? Mm -hmm. And your okay. conscience is always going to bother you if you're a true believer. I, I like this paragraph a lot more than the paragraph two. Yes. And I, I, I haven't really studied in depth the, um, the Westminster Assembly that um, developed this, but my, my guess and again, it's just me guessing, it's just been O'Toole guessing, is that um, in order to balance the muddled speech of paragraph two, this, this was argued for and, and, and added. Yeah. Because it draws a line mm -hmm. to, to say what we were trying to distinguish in the last one. Yes, indeed. Yeah, it's basically saying that there's no power of grace in, in the elements themselves. You know, it, it is mm -hmm. the direction of Christ, yeah, yeah. Good. All right. Uh, the uh, the next uh, proof text comes from the next uh, clause here, H in the paragraph. But upon the work of the Spirit, uh, Matthew 3.11, Jim. Okay. I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit 
and fire. Of course, that's John the Baptist. Correct. And he's speaking of Christ mm -hmm. coming after him, being mightier than him. And Christ did baptize, taking uh, in place of John there for a while. And his disciples did baptize. <clears throat> But the most important thing was after the point of Pentecost, Pentecost, um, when the Spirit came and indwelled the church in, in mass. I mean, it, it was, uh, there were people who, who prophesied, prophets, and there were priests that had evidence of the Spirit, David, um, in writing the Psalms. But it was, it was um, sporadic, or it was, it was a, a more select or restricted group. Moses, the 70 uh, elders that were appointed. But for the church now, because Christ's sacrifice is complete and there is no barrier between us and the Father, mm. um, that the, the Spirit is freely given to all who believe. It's very different. Okay. All right, good. The... Uh... Next passage uh, for Gordon is uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews are Greeks, slaves are free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Um, this section talks about, you know, the, the body of, of Christ being made up of many parts, and there are different the parts. Mm -hmm. The spirit is what we all have in common, and that is the spirit of Christ. And as we have uh, become unified in, in Christ, uh, we are made uh, to drink of one spirit. I think that's what it's saying right now. Yeah. And it goes on to talk about uh, the fact that the body is, is made up of, of many parts, but the, the spirit is what we have in common. Indeed. All right. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, this uh, we transition here to the last uh, clause in paragraph three, and that has to do with, and the word of institution, which contains, together with a precept authorizing the use thereof, a promise of benefit to worthy receivers. Now, what he's talking about here is the grace which is exhibited in or by the sacraments, sacraments that are rightly used and uh so so we're talking about the the words of institution of the sacrament which contains together with, with a precept authorizing the use thereof a promise of benefit to worthy receivers and this first proof text pastor is from matthew 26 and uh so that's uh verses 27 and 28 Right. Yeah. I really, I really like the wording of this, the end of this paragraph, mm -hmm. the verses say, <clears throat> and he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. We're commanded to take part in the Lord's supper. We're commanded to be baptized yes. and in doing so in a worthy manner, there is benefit god has ordained it to be so so when we have there is there is a um a, a communion of the saints and and a, a communion with god in that time of the lord's supper that is unique by god's mm -hmm. by god's doing uh we're not causing it when gordon and phil stand at the table in the front of the church a couple uh a week or so ago um they are not causing it to happen it's us obeying god's word and and a um and we can receive what, what this says here, a promise of benefit to worthy receivers. Indeed. Right. The uh, last proof text of the paragraph, and, and, our, and we'll end with this one today, comes from Matthew 28, famous passage, 19 through 20. Uh, Ray, this is for you. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, 
teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And uh, there's the command to go out and do it. And if he's telling us to do it, then, we, uh, then we're going to, uh, to baptize others. We're going to be baptized. Uh, and then the, uh, I mean, I think the benefit, uh, as you, we talked about there, the benefit, the, pr the promise of the benefit to worthy receivers is, you know, uh, is after the baptism, you know, you're teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. God's word uh, is for our good, for our benefit, uh, and for his glory. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The second part of the uh, you know, the benefit, the promise, uh, he's going to be with us. So uh, when we obey him, we have a benefit. And when we, and he's telling us that, uh, behold, he's also going to be with us until the end of the age. Yeah, the benefit there that I see, I and mean, you guys can add to that. Uh, yeah. What a great benefit that is. Yeah. Yeah. To, yeah. to be with with uh, the Lord to the end of the age. Yeah. Well said, Ray. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, you know, it's interesting. Um, in the modern day church, we have a tendency to think that disciples are made <laughs> at an altar call or a profession of faith or inviting Jesus into your heart. And it, once that's done, everything will fall into place. But that's not an accurate picture uh, of uh, making a disciple because of the rest of the you know the verses or the, what's said here um, in this direction in Matthew um, it's like having a child raising a child for 20 years um, you can't say that I disciplined them one time and therefore everything will fall into line because now they know I will discipline them so they'll follow my instructions if you had any kids, you you know that it is a repeated cycle, not repeated in 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 um, in likes of um, inviting to a new altar call or inviting the or, or or asking Christ to be Lord of your life repeatedly, but as far as an adult saying that you can't do that, that's not good for you. It's not good for the people around you. Don't do that. How true. All right. Well, we our hour is is uh, over. Uh, the next paragraph is there are two more paragraphs left in this chapter, and uh, so we'll begin those at the beginning of our next session. And so I'm going to stop the share. And uh, any uh, any comments, gentlemen, as far as uh, today's uh, session? Any uh, final thoughts? Well, I, I, I do believe that Presbyterians are true believers. And I just like, I don't want to be down on our brothers and sisters that are such. Um, we just we just disagree on this. And uh, and they know that everyone knows this. Um, mm -hmm. But the, these it, I guess we we spent a lot of time today saying how we disagree and we're going to have more of it in the next few sessions i think yes uh, i think that will come up but that's not to say that we don't love and value or or recognize the the genuineness of their faith yes well said in indeed <laughs> all right uh perhaps uh ray would you uh close us in prayer and uh give thanks for this the time we had together today, please. Father, I thank you for uh, your Holy Spirit. Father, I thank you uh, uh, for the elucidation that you uh, uh, shed on your word and uh, the time we're able to uh, look into it and uh, try to get our minds and wrap around, uh, wrap our minds around it. And Father, you are a uh, you've revealed what you've revealed in the scripture and uh, our challenge and our uh, goal is to is to know you and to know you better as we read that so father thank you for this time that we have to do that and uh, father uh, 
continue to be with us uh, as we uh, go on to uh, service uh, tonight and uh, bring us back here next week uh, to do the same. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.